Hello, man. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can yeah. You hear me? Technical, technical glitches. Sorry for that. That's all right. I don't think I've had a um, a Zoom call or a Instagram live where someone's not arrived on mute or anything like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanna before we start, I just wanna ask. First of all, thank you for joining us. I just wanna ask you how you're doing because these are uh, tough times for everyone. We're living in quite uncertain times. So how you're doing and how your family is doing? Yeah, all good, all good. Um, it's obviously, I suppose, it's been for us probably the weirdest summer that I've ever had, either as a player or a coach. Yeah. So, um, that w- that was interesting when when we went into lockdown and trying to. For me, we were still trying to coach our players as best we could, but obviously remotely. So um, that yeah. obviously is challenges. But I think you know the last few weeks we've been back to training, which has been great, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of people have probably missed is that ability to get back and actually play some cricket or get out and about and do stuff. Um, so I certainly played a fair bit of golf when the golf course is reopened. Um, that was pretty good. But yeah, it's been, it's, been, um, it's been an interesting summer. We talk about communication being so important, and especially during these times, because uh, the season actually starts in April and it starts before. So we've, we've not had any cricket. How are you communi- communicating with your team? With your colleagues, with with the whole setup, how are you communicating? Yeah, so we we actually for our for the girls that I work with at, um, at Loughborough University and now with Lightning Cricket, the a lot of those girls yeah. would get up to playing the hundred. Um, so yeah. that was obviously a big competition for them, a big summer for women's cricket, um, and pretty much yeah, we had a we had a pre season tour lined up, and we were about to go to Cape Town and. And everything went into lockdown, so it was for us that just threw a lot of a lot of our plans out the window to begin with. But um, you know, working with with our team, we did as much as we could through Zoom calls, through any you know yeah. form of online video call, and just try to just try to keep in touch with everyone. Um, because one thing we found is, is in a different situation, um, you know, I feel quite fortunate in the sort of the town that I live in, we could still get out in, um, you know, into the countryside and stuff like that. So um, we didn't feel massively locked down as some people would have done. So, um, you know, for for me, it was about just trying to touch base with our players as often as possible and making sure that we had regular communication with them so that we could essentially provide whatever support was required. Um, and, and it certainly made us think about different yeah. ways of Sure. I just want to uh, thank you for answering that. I just want to tell the viewers just a little background about Rob. Rob is the current uh, cricket head coach of Lightning, um, and he has played for Lubbera MCCU, Leicestershire, as well as playing international cricket for Scotland. And um, I just want to start, uh, Rob, with the younger days. How did you start? How did you start playing the sport of cricket? Who inspired you? Just if you could just briefly talk about your younger days getting into the sport of cricket. Yeah, definitely. So, I, I mean, I, I probably had a fairly normal route into cricket. You know, watched watched my dad play local club cricket on a Saturday yeah. afternoon. Um, you know, spent spent a lot of my time in the summer down there. Um, so, kind of, yeah, just started playing a bit of club cricket myself, a bit of school cricket, um, and worked my way up into into the county age groups, really. So, I played all my age group cricket at North Ants. Um, and then... Sort of made when when we got to it was kind of seventeen eighteen and it was about you know do you jump on a jump or get selected for an academy or or not kind of thing I kind of missed out in North Hans. Um and went and went and actually had a couple of tr- a trial up at Leicestershire um, which turned into um, a bit of a you know my first trial there was played the second half of the summer after school um, and then went yeah. away for, into Australia um, and then came back and actually didn't get picked up then by Leicester. So that's when I went to Loughborough. Um, and kind of the journey into first-class cricket kind of really started really when I was at Loughborough. Talk me through your debut uh, against Kent for Loughborough MCCU. How was that feeling? If... Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, Garen Jones got a few. I think he got 100 and plenty. <laughs> um, managed to get him, I think, caught, I think he was my first first-class wicket, caught point. Um, off a drag down and he'd probably had enough of whacking us around but 
you know, that was, for, for me, the route through Loughborough was kind of my second go at trying to make it as a pro. Um, obviously, the first trial at Leicester hadn't worked out, hadn't got the contract I was hoping for. Um, but then then went to Loughborough and played um, under Graham Dilley. So he, he was um, he was the coach at the time. Um, yeah. And, yeah, we, you know, the, the MCC programme was a great shop window for... Um, for guys my age trying to trying to make it as a pro and get a degree at the same time but you know that was I suppose as a uni student making a first class debut in a university game that was the big opportunity um to to kind of showcase your skills and and you know that I suppose for me that was a that was an amazing occasion to um to kind of play in it lost yeah um so it was, yeah, yeah I did it that first opportunity to play a first class match and and probably for me one of that was the biggest game I'd played in at that stage but um you know fortunate that my time at Loughborough went went well um and that led on to me me playing in sort of in bigger teams and playing full time I want to after that you start playing for Leicestershire in the 2011 season just talk me through that uh, transition from playing for Loughborough to playing for Leicestershire and how did that pan out for you yeah so that was i suppose that was second my second year at university so i just coming to the end of that of that second year at uni and um probably you know for, for me i was at a stage where i'd i'd already as i said already had a go at leicester it hadn't worked out i'd yeah. then played you know one year of university cricket and played some first class games um and with the program i was getting towards you know the end of that second year and potentially you know in a situation where i was going do I need to seriously think about another career path or is cricket going to work out? Um, and we played, we played a game at Grace Road. Um, I was playing for the university against Leicester and managed second, second innings got a hundred. Um, and that, that sort of led on that sort of restarted the conversations with Leicester. Um, and it coincided nicely with, with Leicestershire having a, a very good run in, um, in the T20 comp. Um, and and so I made made my first class debut with Leicestershire the week before T20 finals day. So they were resting a few of the lads ahead of the weekend, um, and I made my debut in that game and picked up three for I think it was and, and 75 on in that first game and and then played played the rest of the season. So that was you know it was kind of a an opportunity you know that being right place right time to get some runs and. Um, and then it kind of went from there. So that was, yeah, that was that was a really good summer for me. Um, managed to play, you know, our second game was Middlesex at Lords. Um, Strauss play was about two hundred. So, you know, I thought, wow, this is this is pretty cool. I'm watching the England captain while I'm playing at Lords. He's scoring a double ton. So, um, you know, the, I suppose the experiences that have presented themselves to me through through my career have been. Um, you know, I've been pretty fortunate and I always, when I was playing, I always felt I was in a very fortunate position to to be the job that I was doing. Um, and I think even now coaching, I feel like I'm in a very similar situation. Before we crack on with further questions, I just want to tell the viewers that please feel free to ask anything. Obviously, appropriate questions for an Instagram live session uh, to ask Rob. And just before that, I just want to quickly tell the viewers about some Vitae Sports news. So we have uh, six of Vitae Sports players currently playing um, for Pakistan against England. So that's going on. The second test is going on. And spin bowling coach Chris Brown has joined the Scotland cricket team. And um, Floyd Reifer, Amir Jangu and Kevin Sinclair will start play to play in the Caribbean Premier League next week. And uh, one of our clients, Oliver Hannan Dalby, who we've done an Instagram live session, which was a really fun one, uh, who plays for Warwickshire, took career best figures of 6 for 33 and 6 for 77 against Gloucestershire. And Ed Barnes moved on loan to Derbyshire, and Adam Finn joined Surrey on loan, both taking wickets on their debut. So we've had an amazing week. Our clients have had an amazing week. And um, so we've, we've just got a few questions, Rob. I'll just take those first, if that's fine with you. Uh, we had a question from Pritesh and he is asking if you could please ask him whether his shoulder pains while throwing down to batters. I think Pritesh is from, 
he joined our sessions before also he is also a coach so maybe he wants to know that if your shoulder pain yes it's a good it's a good question i mean i i suppose my shoulder probably is the freshest it's been in the last 4 years because we've actually done a lot less coaching this summer than i would have done previously so um yeah i yeah i i think for me the the best invention that's come out recently for coaches is the side arm i mean it it is literally it has completely changed the game because there's only for me i i only want to do so much work with players on a bowling machine because at times i think yeah. it doesn't it, it's not as realistic as facing a bowler and obviously through the winter months you and even you know through the heat of competition when the season gets busy you're actually trying to manage your bowlers as much as possible so you know or you've not always got um you've not always got bowlers to have a you know to bowl at the batters and as i say I've yeah. been too often so yeah for me i i use the side arm as much as possible um i think i'm obviously throwing a lot more now than i did when i was playing um but i think yeah just if if you have got any issues with it you know i think just just make sure you're looking after your shoulder a bit you know warming up properly and that sort of thing you know it's something that we talk to the players a lot about um but sometimes as a coach you just jump straight into the net and start throwing balls without really <laughs> so i've yeah touch wood i've i've never had a situation where i've thrown my shoulder out or or had a shoulder injury so um but yeah a little bit of stiffness definitely when when you get busy for sure Thanks for answering that, Pratesh. I hope that answers your question. We got a question from Shreya Jain from Mumbai. What keeps you motivated to work out regularly uh, during the pandemic? So I, I've it's a good question. I I went through two stages probably. I um, I started doing loads of running um, just because yeah. I found I found if I'm up on my feet coaching all day, I'm probably up and you know I'm up there for maybe six hours on my feet. by the walking you know walking around nets or um you know running sessions and that sort of thing and i probably covered about 18 to 20,000 steps a day um and then also we went into lockdown and i basically just found myself sat behind a desk and i know i've never sat behind a desk as much as i have <laughs> you know this summer so started doing quite a lot of running um i've got a road bike as well so i just got on that and actually got out and about and and actually you know I found that a really good way of of just clearing my mind of you know sometimes it's good because things about work crop up in your mind when you're not really thinking about it and and stuff like that so I just made sure I set myself you know time each day or at least four times a week to to just go out and do something um and try and keep active because I found that that sort of broken up the monotony of of being sat inside and stuck inside the whole time. So I think you know I know a lot of guys um at my local cricket club have have done the same and and we set up a yeah. WhatsApp kind of just of once he'd been out for a ride he just popped on the message and and that was really beneficial for guys in our at our club especially who are missing you know if anything they're missing that social interaction that you normally have with with guys on a Saturday afternoon at cricket or the club nets during the week that she found just communicating through that was was really beneficial um but i'm yeah i have to be active i have to be up and about doing stuff and so i've made sure that each week i put time aside to get out and do things thanks for answering i hope that answers shreya's question it's motivated me rob's answer so i might start getting more and working more on my fitness room tomorrow <laughs> so we've got quite a few more questions coming in i just want to ask a few questions which i had first about your scotland days so and we've also got uh, matt macken thanks for joining kevin sinclair we were just talking about you so a big best of luck for you for the caribbean premier league thanks for joining us for the session and um, i just want to tell the viewers about a heroic innings uh, rob played and he entered with scotland at 169 for 6 needing 92 from 12.5 overs to reach the third world cup for scotland and your unbeaten 46 of only 37 balls secured scotland's passage to australia and new zealand for the world cup so just talk me through that innings what was going through your mind and how how did you pace that innings yeah so i mean one thing that matt will know is just joined is that 
that was pretty much the only runs I scored all tournament. So, um, <laughs> pretty much for, say for the biggest game. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it was a it was a really cool tournament. I had I had some wicked times with Scotland. You know, we got to tour probably twice a year in the winter, um, and and I joined a, at a really exciting time where you know there was qualification for the World Cup coming up, and and that was something that we as a team had very much set our sights on getting into that getting into that competition in 2015 um so yeah so we were playing kenya at christchurch and um went as you say with still a few needed and 12 overs to go and um i was actually batting preston momson our captain at the time was was in on i think he was on 60 odd so i was able to just kind of just bat and, and not take too many risks um and just get myself in you know i had a net with we had paul collingwood as our assistant coach at the time and um you know, he was very aware that I hadn't scored any runs all comp and, and in the morning <laughs> just go out and play and don't worry about anything and um and that'll give you the best chance of being successful and, and so was very much yeah, just just played the situation that was in front of me and um I suppose try tried not to think too much about the you know, how big a moment it was gonna be for Scottish cricket. You know, trying to qualify for that World Cup was everything we, you know, we were trying to achieve, and and it was a pretty big carrot to be dangled on the end, you know, the end of that game. So, um, so I just, yeah, I just batted with Preston for a bit, and um, he then got out, and Safi Sharif came in, and um, and we just we just ticked along. I didn't really feel like we we had to take too many risks as as we went through, and um, you know, I managed. To, Towards the end, managed to get one out the middle that took it to less than a run of ball, and and you know that one went for six, and then it was kind of like okay, right, I think we needed four off the last over or something. So that kind of just made it manageable. But um, it was yeah, it was it was a wicked day. It was you know talked about my hundred on debut uh, or my hundred against Leicestershire when I was at Loughborough and making my first class yeah. debut, probably at the time topped it, and I you know. I'm not sure many times have topped that day really. Um, to to be in a situation where you know to hit the winning runs, I mean, albeit through a misfield, but you know hit a hit a pretty hit a decent drive and and luckily extra cover let it through his legs and we were away kind of thing. So it was just yeah one of those days where you know luck favors the brave. Absolutely, <laughs> I think. You know, We'd, we'd played a pretty exciting brand of cricket. You know, guys had done well throughout the comp and we had a stint down in Queenstown where we played, I think, three games down there and we were based in Queenstown for about 10 days. And and there was just a really good feel about the whole group for the whole competition. Um, and there's one thing I think we, we did really well as a group through that period was we enjoyed the experiences that we were all having together. Um, yeah. We took our cricket obviously very seriously and, and wanted to do well and win every competition that we were playing in. But at the same time, the beauty of, of the schedule allowed us to have some downtime to actually yeah. go, and, go and see, you know, the different parts of the country that we were playing in um, and the countries we were playing in. And and I think that was massively important. You know, we had, a, we had a good group of guys who all wanted to do well, but wanted to have a good time along the way. And, um, and I think that, that went a long way to... To us being successful in that qualifying tournament, um, and and get us, yeah, essentially, you know, get us that reward of of going to the World Cup the following year. Thanks for answering that. Uh, I want to get you. We had a couple of questions regarding coaching, and I specifically was getting you transitioned at a very young age from being a player to becoming a coach. So there's a question from Rajiv. He asks, is coaching as physically demanding as playing, especially when you have taken up coaching at such a young age? So I would say on a training day, you, you're you probably on your feet more than the players. Um, yeah. But then flip it around onto a match day, you do all your work in the morning, um, getting players warmed up. And, and then, then you, you kind of watch the they game. They do all the stuff, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. obviously go to the game. So I think certainly... Like I was saying earlier, I, I try and spend as much time on my feet during training and, and trying to be in, you know, as involved as I can in terms of throwing balls or, you know, running drills or whatever it is. I want to be involved in, in what the players 
are doing, getting close to the action, you know, having conversations with them. And, and so that's, you know, I would say from a, yeah, from it, it can get physically demanding, you know, we, we had a middle practice yeah. this week, um, up at Loughborough and, and actually, you know, I ended up fielding for 40 overs and it was, you know, it was about 30 degrees. So, um, that was a slightly different, you know, the day was slightly different to how I'd planned it to be, but you know, yeah, even then I came off that thinking, yeah, 40 overs of fielding in a middle practice was, um, was enough for me for that day. Um, but I think it's, you know, for, for me, I think now the, the, the level that I'm coaching and with the women's game going professional, I'm going to expect our players to have a certain level of fitness. Um, and I think if I'm going to be yeah. asking the girls to be like that, then I need to set some form of, ex of example as well. Um, and so make sure that I'm still trying to be as fit as possible. And, um, you know, those long days when you are coaching, your fitness does come into it. If you know you don't want to be dropping off because you've been, you know, in the nets for for three, four hours, you don't want to be dropping off for that final forty minutes you've got with the yeah. player. But they're last on the schedule, and you've been on your feet for a period of time. So, for me, I... your voice is cracking, uh, Rob. It's oh, I it? can't hear you properly. Yeah, it's better now. It's better now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just want to ask you how, when you got into coaching, how did you get into women's? Uh, women's cricket how did that happen so it was, it's i've sort of gone full circle really so when i finished it um when i finished at leicestershire got released from my contract and and did a bit of coaching on the leicestershire age groups over that winter but basically just picked up the phone to um to sal briggs who was the coach at loughborough at the time and and said you know i'm, I'm getting into coaching I'm keen to get some experience, you know, whatever, whatever I can do. I felt I had a fair bit to offer from my transition through Loughborough University and into professional cricket. I could offer that experience yeah. with the university guys and girls um, at the time. So it just kind of started with, with a few, few hours a week with, on the MCCU program. Um, and, and it just went from there really, you know, that was, that was a couple of nights a week. And then, Timing is, you know, I think similar to when I signed my first contract with Leicester, it was right place, right time. It's the Gear Super League was going into its second year, um, and and Sal asked me if I wanted to be involved in that for the summer, and and then she um, later on the following year then took a job in in Australia, and that opened up the position at, at Loughborough as head coach. So, um, you know, I was I was. I found women's cricket when I first started really interesting because I didn't have, you know, when I was playing, I had no real experience of it or, or coaching in it. So um, I was very much at the stage of if I'm going to take up coaching full time, I need to get as much experience across the board as possible. So, yeah, you know, with the Loughborough guys, with the Loughborough girls, Leicestershire age groups, um, I did a bit of work with the ECB learning and physical disability teams and just trying to get myself in different environments and find the path that I wanted to go down. And, um, and as it worked out, you know, stuff at Loughborough has gone really well. So very, yeah, you know, it was kind of just, I'm going to make the transition as quickly as possible um, and, and get set up into the next thing, you know, that I want to do. And, you know, the, the, the PCA did a lot of work um, in helping me kind of get, clarity on what I wanted to do next and the route I wanted to go down yeah. so I think that's you know that's one thing that probably while I was at university I was I was there to play cricket but I knew I was going to hopefully get a half decent degree as well um, yeah. so that it at some point I could use it and then through my playing career at Leicester I, I probably put my next stage on the back burner a little bit because I was I was trying to focus so much on my playing and and it wasn't yeah it wasn't until my final summer in um, 2016 where I suddenly thought actually right I need to really think about what I'm going to do next um, and and it kind of just went from there again as I say with that phone call to Loughborough and a bit of coaching on the pathway at Leicestershire so I was I was I was pretty keen to leave Leicester on good terms um, you know yeah. I, I, fair enough I've I've had a great time here I've really enjoyed it I've loved my experience as a full time pro but. If it's going to be, you know, if it's going to come to an end, I'm going to focus on what I'm going to do next. So I think, you know, that was that was an important kind of four or five months for me as I made that transition. 
Um, and I played a little bit of minor counties as well through the summer to try and bridge that gap, which which was brilliant. Went over and played for Norfolk for a couple of summers, and that was really good fun. Um, mm. And it's yeah, the, you know, the coaching just has has kind of developed into a into a full time role, which is nice. So, I was reading this interview which you recently did um, when you became the Lightning head coach, and you said about uh, that this is a great opportunity to develop elite women's cricket in the East Midlands at a time when the sport is gaining momentum globally. And when you say global, where do you think it's growing most in terms of popularity? Because I know uh, if you're working in women's cricket, you must be getting this question. How is it like? What is the setup? How is it growing? Is it really growing? Is it really global? Because there's, I think there's a lack of awareness about women's cricket per se. So what do you, what's your take on it? Yeah, I think I think the game is is growing globally. I think, you know, yeah. In the UK, you had you had the kids in the last four years with semi pro competition. Uh, that's kind of followed on from the big bash in Australia, and then over the last couple of years, you know, talk about a women's IPL in India, and I know that's been confirmed for for this year as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Albeit at the same time, the women's big bash, which I know was um you know, caused a few or raised a few eyebrows with the timing of that but you know i just i look at i look at the the effect the women's world cup had last year in australia and and i think australia have probably got the best model for developing the women's game um you know both the big bash and then the way that the way that they ran that world cup um and to you know almost fill the mcg the final was you know was absolutely amazing and i think that you know stuff like that i think it's going to take time but i think examples of that you know that world cup final i think you look at the the crowds they get at the big bash games you i look at the crowds that we had during the super league um yeah where you see you know we saw we saw the crowd numbers get bigger and bigger certainly our home game loughborough and then we go down to finals days at Hove and, you know, that's practically sold out as well. And I think women's cricket now is just getting, it's getting more airtime, getting the airtime it deserves. Um, and, and I think it's, it's really important for the ECB to actually now the new elite domestic structure. Hopefully that's a five year project to, to grow the women's game in the UK. Um, and I know that in, in countries like Australia and India where cricket is, is a big sport. Um, yeah, you know I can see the women's IPL being a massive success, and and that will that will naturally grow the game. Uh, I think at the international level, there's probably still a gap with Australia, England, and, and India, um, and New Zealand are kind of chasing that pack pretty closely. And um, I think it's it's kind of going to take a few countries a little bit of time to catch up from an international level, but it's. Yeah, it's about it's about prioritising those countries, giving them the support that their international teams need, and the, the you know the pathway below that to really develop the game. Um, and I think that's why that's why the new setup in the UK is so exciting because we have got the opportunity to work with players all year um, and really work with them and really work with the ECB to to kind of understand well, what what sort of players the England want that's going to make them successful at the international level and how can we as the teams the regions below that support that that vision um, so I think yeah it's, it's, it is growing massively I really do believe that um, and it's the case now of I think I'm going to chase the level that Australia has set um, over the last few years it's interesting uh, when you mentioned Australia because I was actually at the MCG in January and I was at a summit there and uh, the ICC cricket uh, um, head was there and he spoke about how they've planned for this, the final specifically to be on International Women's Day and how they've planned to get Katy Perry also giving fan more things to do. Maybe that could be the answer for women's cricket, maybe getting more fan engagement activities to to have more activities for the fans, for the children, just to get them to the stadiums. Because I remember he told me that uh, they are expecting around seventy to 80,000 people 
and the actual number actually went to eighty six thousand one hundred and thirty seven, which was a record for, and that is a number you normally get at the MCG for a boxing day test match. So, I mean, I don't think we should compare it to uh, men's cricket, but now if you really do compare it, the numbers were similar. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's. Yeah, I think it's it's one thing that um, it's interesting you say about comparing. I, I think if you're if you're comparing the event, absolutely, you know that that event yeah. as you can compare that. I think try and compare the two games, you get into kind of a little bit of dodgy water because the games are played the games are played differently. But Australia made that day and that final more than just a game of cricket. Um, yeah. They made it a massive event, as you say. It's experience. And it is, and it yeah, it's it's an experience for players. You know, we. I think I think that's that's what made it so great. Is it wasn't just we're going to have a we're going to have a game of cricket with a trophy presentation at the end. We're going to turn this thing into a whole concert, and we're going to have a celebration. And it's you know, it was just the fairy tale ending. The fact that Australia were in that game as well, and. Even India was there, but we lost terribly. We didn't play well, so I think if you're talking about trying to grow the game globally, India probably yeah, yeah. the final with Australia because the following yeah. game would have been you know yeah. in the stadium, but but on TV and that sort of thing as well. So I think yeah, I think Australia <laughs> pretty well over the last few years. Thanks, Arshid. Then I want to ask you about your experience of working with Darren in Vita Sports. How has the experience been over the few years you've been with the brand? Yeah, it's been great. It's been great. Um, so I, I first met Darren last last year, I think it was. Um, Chris Brown, who I played at Norfolk with, kind of put it in contact. And, yeah. Um, and it's just yeah, you know, I was at a stage where you know looking you know still developing as a coach and, and looking to see what support i could get and, um and you know darren straight away was was keen to help out and has been really helpful in the process of you know my coaching journey and you know almost you know it's just it's just someone who you can pick up the phone to and chat cricket or chat cricket. But when you're looking at you know as a coach or as a player you're trying to build a support network around you um, they're the kind of people you want around who you know are going to have your best interests at heart, and and that's that's probably one of the one of the best things is this, working with Vita is just going through that process of okay if I need to pick up the phone and down about something you're going to be there and, and we can have a good so yeah it's all it's been it's been a really good experience over the last twelve months. Before. Thank you for that. Uh, before. We finish. I have I have one question for you, and I would request the viewers if you guys have any questions, please keep them coming, and I will take those questions. So my question, actually, last question is: How do you think women's cricket can gain more popularity? I think you briefly touched upon upon it, and how exciting are the new opportunities coming into women's cricket? Yeah, I think. I mean, this this summer would have been a big. You know, yeah. Getting women's cricket on on Sky and on the BBC and stuff, I think that would have, that would have really been forward. But we can we can do that next year. I, I think that's you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the benefit of it. I mean, we, we've obviously got our our competition starting in the next couple of weeks, but um, you know that's all behind closed doors. So hopefully there'll be some form of streaming. It's not going to be as mm -hmm. TV coverage, but um, this for me this summer is just about getting people playing cricket. We've yeah. got, you know, we're obviously going to try and do as well as we can in our comp and try to put a recreational level below in our region. It's you know we've seen our county age group girls getting back into cricket and and just playing playing some games and a few of our girls have been back to playing club cricket on Saturday and and stuff like that. So I think uh, yeah for me it's. I don't think we've lost women's cricket will lose momentum this summer. I think it will just be held back slightly um, before we can really kick start it again next year. Um, and hopefully, you know, England women have a, will have some cricket this summer. Um, yeah. Because, you know, as we we saw definitely the 
the games that we played at Loughborough over the four years of the Super League, we saw our we saw our following get bigger and bigger, both game itself but on social media as well. Yeah. And and that that's something that I think is really important is is just making the players that we're working with accessible to the aspiring players in the pathway. Um and we actually when we ran experience days before match days over the last couple of years, we actually saw more and more young boys coming into those, not just young girls. And and that was fine to see from a women's cricket point of view because you're not just inspiring young girls, you're actually right. Guys can and boys can you know associate themselves with this cricket as well. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Thank you very well. Thank you for answering that. I'll just take a couple of fan questions. And we got one from uh, Jalal Coach. He said, how important is setting of core values of team in developing the team culture? I think it's massive. Um, it's a problem that we're going through at the moment with light cricket. Um, that as a yeah. new team set up, it's, for me, it's got to involve the players. You, you, know, you have to have your players involved in the process, they've got to own it. You can't just sit there and put them in a put them in a meeting room and put up a PowerPoint presentation and say, right, this is what we're gonna do. It, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Uh, we've we've gone through a process of essentially establishing that's a belief with the players. So, right, what are we gonna be accountable for? How are we gonna prepare ourselves as individuals, as a team to ready to win games of cricket uh, and what are we going to do throughout a competition that's going to give us the best successful and, and to have that driven by the players it, um, you know you, you want your players to identify with the team they're playing for not identify with their own individual goals yeah. you, you can have players who identify with the team that puts you in such a strong position because everyone is working everyone's working for each other um, and I'm a big believer that you've got a strong team that works together even if you haven't got superstar players within that team that team will have a really good time being successful uh, and it's you know I'll give, give an example we had, um, we had a game at Loughborough but our kind of regional team was playing but regional day off for, it was a day off for senior players we had one of our senior players playing well or game and we had nine of our squad of our squad. and I think for me I would just probably have a look at yeah, but it's a lot about the group that we've got that girls wanted to spend time on a day when they could have been off doing other stuff uh, and I think those are the babies and those core values essentially driven by players of what is Thank you for that. I hope that answers uh, Chilal's question. Um, thank you, Lipsirat, Heather, Betty, Jordan, Lyrics. Thanks for joining, Luke. Hey, we've, I will just take one more question from. Navendu Thagyu, thank you. Arunima, thank you for joining. Spectacular, thank you for joining. Drake, Harvey Lockwood, thanks for joining. Charlie Barn, Andrew Shear. The last question I have is from, again, from Rajiv Jenny Singh. What do you think is the most exciting, who do you think is the most exciting women's cricketer in the world right now? And very, why? Very good question. Um, I'd say so she's just broken onto the international scene with England. Um, so a leg spinner called Sarah Glenn who played during the Super League with us. Um, she played her counter cricket at Derbyshire um, and spent spent sort of three yeah three years in our Super League side. And she was someone who was just a consistent performer and made a, broke her way onto um, the England Academy um, and then made her debut. Um, she went on tour with England last year, and I think. You know, she's someone who this summer would have really, really cemented herself as an England as an England player. I think she's done very yeah. well. Is pretty much in there, but 
you know, she goes under the radar a little bit with her bowling and bowls leggy to wicket to wicket. But I think very few people know that she whack it as well. Um, <laughs> and she got she got some runs in the England game that they played this week. And I think she's definitely one who is progressing really well. Um, I think a number of girls who are breaking into that England setup off the bat who are really really exciting players and uh, certainly you know there's there's plenty in women's yeah I think have a whole list for you but I think the new setup that we've got in with the in next year yeah we're gonna, give a big boost yeah definitely it's I think it, the women's game is, is giving players the opportunity to get exposure to high pressure situations and that's why the Super League was so good. That's why the hundreds be so good. Is because players are going to be under pressure, and and that's yeah. how you learn. That's how you develop. Is you, know, you, you can do so much in a net or in a training session, but I need experience to call upon. Um, to, and, and that's that's essentially I think where we'll see with the with the game in England, the women's game over the next few years really kick on because players will get that exposure to high pressure situations again. So, really good in a really good competition that includes some of the best international players in the world that's what we yeah. want our local players to be competing in i want to thank you rob taylor from uh, the vita sports team for a really fun session you've given us a lot of insights and it's been really amazing to get to know more about women's cricket and hopefully we will see some cricketing action uh, from international or domestic women's cricket all over the world and we wish you a best of luck for uh, the season and hopefully everything uh, gets well because we are living in uncertain times and um, i want to thank all the viewers for joining us uh, this instagram chat would also be on our um, profile so you can view it whenever you want to and uh, rob thank you so much regards to your family and please stay safe and hopefully we'll see more budding talent coming from your team under your guidance thanks very much thanks for having me it's been great fun thank you rob take care thank you cheers bye bye right. so guys another fun session uh, comes to an end and thank you for staying with us a uh, few it issues we've had who doesn't these days but we'll try to figure it out next time and Thank you, spectacular Laura Steed. Thanks for joining. Navendra Tagiu, hi. Thanks for joining. Uh, AC Williamson, Lawson. I just want to say that please stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy, and do watch England, Pakistan. And uh, please join us again next week. We will be here again, and we will let you know the time and the date for yet another fun-filled Instagram session. Please follow our social media handles on Twitter, Instagram. called Vita Sports and on YouTube thank you stay safe stay healthy